jumpers all star basketball shoot. <clears throat> You're the greatest, and that's no jive. Your standard equipment on the B Street 5. As I fly through the air doing my famous slam dunk, I'm flying first class, and that ain't no bunk. My shoes will be wearing the con to they bronze my feet for the Hall of Fame. Converse All Stars, limousines for the feet. Converse All Stars. Converse, manufacturers of America's number one basketball shoe, the Converse All-Star, brings you the 28th in a series of championship basketball films. You'll see the top games, the top stars, and interesting sidelines of America's greatest game. With the conclusion of the 1973-74 regular season schedule, the real drama unfolds with basketball tournaments and playoffs from coast to coast. Let's take a look at the collegiate and professional postseason classics that made history in 1974. Hutchinson, Kansas is the site of the National Junior College Basketball Tournament as defending champion Mercer County College faces Chipola Junior College in the finals. Mercer in white gets bullseye shooting from Harold Hood in the corner en route to an early six-point lead. Mercer County from Trenton, New Jersey sports a 29-2 mark coming into tonight's championship match and must be considered the favorite. Just one year ago, Mercer captured its first National Junior College title. Harry Lay's rebound bucket gives Mercer an eight-point bulge at the half as they aim to become the first school to repeat since Mobley Area Junior College in 1966-67. Chipola, Florida, solves Mercer's full-court press and races back into contention. Tournament MVP Al Gardner paces the Chipola comeback with sensational outside shooting. Gardner hits, and Chipola is down by just two. Mercer plays a patterned offense looking for Connie White in the low post. Marty Prendergast into White, and Connie's jump shot is good. Mercer maintains the lead in the closing minute of action. Chipola won't panic. They're trying to shake Al Gardner loose. Al Culver to Gardner, the jumper is short. Number 35, John Billups leaps high for the rebound and his fall away shot is perfect. But time runs out on the Chipola rally as they fall two points short. Mercer wins it, 60 to 58, for their second consecutive national junior college championship. City hosts the NAIA Championship. After six hectic days of marathon basketball, it turns out to be an all-Southern final between Alcorn State and West Georgia College. West Georgia in red was seated 14th, but fought its way to the title game with a dramatic semifinal victory over Kentucky State behind the clip shooting of Tom Turner. Turner still holds the hot hand. When Turner isn't turning West Georgia on as the tournament MVP, Clarence Foots Walker doing the job. Alcorn State sets up big number 44, John McGill, for a turnaround jumper, and he banks it home. West Georgia coach Roger Kaiser was afraid his team might be tired, but a 10-point burst at the end of the half put that theory to rest. And in the second half, Foots Walker delights the crowd with ball handling, steals, rebounding, and scoring. West Georgia sprints out to a 13-point advantage. The flashy walker feeds Tom Turner in the corner, but Turner misses, and Alcorn races up court. William Bell gets two points back the hard way, crashing to the floor on a driving layup. However, West Georgia has too many guns for Alcorn State tonight, and as time expires, West Georgia is on top, 97 to 79. The new NAIA champs surprise the experts with their fifth straight upset win in tournament play. Congratulations to coach Roger Kaiser and West Georgia College. Kansas State University hosts the 1974 finals of the AIAW third annual women's basketball tournament. Mississippi College, a smooth, well-drilled quintet, is hopeful of dethroning two-time champion Immaculata College. The Mississippi team is prepared for rugged competition that will extend all over the court from the top of the backboards right down to floor level. Coached by Kathy Rush, the mighty Max of Immaculata featured tough defense, great rebounding, and a polished offense led by the high scorer number 12, Teresa Shank. In the early going, Immaculata displays its backboard strength. They crash the offensive boards time and time again before Denise Conway scores. 
An airtight defense forces Mississippi into costly mistakes and gives number 23, Marianne Crawford, a chance to do her thing. After trailing briefly in the opening minutes, Immaculata runs off a string of 15 straight points. But Mississippi refuses to fall. Playing under women's rules that include a 30-second clock to eliminate stalling tactics, Mississippi's controlled offense sets up number 24, Glenn Schmidt, for a pretty turnaround jump shot. Immaculata comes right back. Mary Sharp to Teresa Shank and the Sharp Shooting Center banks it home. Trailing 38 to 27, Mississippi bounces to life as Glenda Carpenter displays her soft touch. And here's a play that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would certainly recognize as Rita Easterling sets up every woman Connie Smith. Connie's sweeping hook shot as a beauty to be closer to within seven at the half. Talks to Immaculata as the women from Pennsylvania crash the boards at both ends of the court. Marianne Crawford shows some cat-like quickness. But she misses the shot. Marianne gets her own rebound, feeds number 35, Tina Craw, and the Immaculata faithful love it. Leading 66 to 53, the Mighty Max proved they're the queens of the court once again. Marianne Crawford winds up a super performance with this shot as Immaculata battles to a 68 to 53 win over Mississippi College. With three straight national titles and only four losses in the past four seasons, the girls from Immaculata College have every good reason to celebrate. St. Louis Arena is the setting for a brand new championship. It's the first annual Collegiate Commissioners Association tournament with Indiana and Southern California advancing to the finals. USC gets a quick start as Gus Williams passes to the fast-breaking Bob Crowbridge. John Laskowski of Indiana gets the worst of that collision, but draws the charging foul on Trowbridge. Laskowski is a quick healer as he comes down to the other end and registers two points for the Hoosiers. Indiana's Kent Benson hooks his way to a pretty three-point play, and that provides the difference of halftime. Indiana, 40. USC, 37. In the second half, the Hoosiers start rolling as Bob Wilkerson feeds Steve Green. Green gets the good bounce for two of his game-high 24 points. Quinn Buckner has the Indiana fast break in high gear, and his slick ball handling tops the assist column for both teams. On this play, he sets up Ken Benson inside. Benson shoots and hits. Quinn Buckner controls for Indiana once more. This time, Buckner can't find an open man and puts it up himself. And the Indiana crowd anticipates victory. The USC Trojans never stop battling, but Indiana's sharpshooters have too much second half firepower to overcome. Dan Selleck closes out the scoring, but Indiana captures the Collegiate Commissioners Tournament with a convincing 85 to 60 win over USC. New York City's famed Madison Square Garden hosts the National Invitation Tournament with Purdue and Utah ready to do battle in the championship game. Purdue in the gold uniforms upset North Carolina, the free tournament favorite, in the opening round. Dave Luke is considered the defensive specialist, but his shooting appears to be right on the money, too. The Boilermakers are 20 and 9 overall, but early in the year, they had number one ranked North Carolina State down by 15 in the second half, only to lose by five. Frank Kendrick, who starred against the Wolfpack, takes his frustration out on Utah. The Redskins are led by sophomore Tiki Burton. This is the second year Tiki led Utah's scoring parade, and here's how he does it. Inside, Utah goes to Mike Sojourner, whose brother Willie plays for the New York Nets. Mike's shot is rejected, but Frank Kendrick has called for goaltending. The two points count, no matter what Coach Fred Schaus says. John Garrett looks for an open man, and Bruce Parkinson takes over. Parkinson drives and twists down the lane. Pretty play! Utah's Tyrone Medley resorts to a dangerous cross-court pass against Purdue's zone defense, but it pays off as Chaz Benatti shoots and hits. The Boilermakers put it all together late in the contest as Frank Kendrick owns the hot hand. 
Kendrick registers a game high 25 points. Here he goes, one on one against Doug Terry. Frank Kendrick hits again, and the Purdue fans are in ecstasy. Utah fights back behind the inspired play of tournament MVP Mike Sojourner, but there's just not enough time left on the clock. Utah falls 87-81, and the Purdue Boilermakers are the 1974 NIT title holders. Fieldhouse in Indianapolis is the scene for an international high school classic as the Indiana All-Stars challenge the Russian All-Stars. This marks the first time a Soviet Union high school team has visited the United States, and it's also the initial appearance of an Indiana high school All-Star team in international competition. After the teams exchange gifts, the action is rugged, and the Russians' deliberate style gives them a slim edge in the early going. The international rules allow more body contact than the Indiana youngsters are accustomed to, and it's taking them a while to get acclimated. Nice shot. Midway through the first half, the Indiana All-Stars move into high gear as Roy Taylor connects from the corner, and then Tony Marshall passes behind his back to Wayne Radford. continues his dazzling ball handling act as he combines with Bradford once again. That's some dynamic duo. The use of the 30-second clock under international rules doesn't seem to affect the Indiana team as they surge to a 10-point margin. As the Russians get two points back, you can notice another international rule with the foul lane widening out from the free throw line in toward the basket. Steve Kalia passes to Roy Taylor for a jump shot that's up and in as the Indiana All-Stars begin to pull away for good. The U.S. team outclasses the visitors in almost every department, including rebounding, as Tony Marshall tips one in. Coach Kirby Overman uses all ten men on his squad as Indiana rolls it up. Larry Moore sets up Wayne Radford for two more of his game-high 19 points. The Indiana High School All-Stars keep right on popping and run roughshod over the touring Russian stars by the final tally of 92 to 60. However, the result is not as important as the goodwill created by U.S.-Soviet competition in an era of detente. The NCAA championship site is Greensboro, North Carolina, as Marquette and North Carolina State move into the finals. What? No UCLA? That's right. The Bruins dynasty is over. The men of Johnny Wooden were seeking their eighth straight national championship, their 10th in 11 years, but the monopoly ended in the semifinal round, leaving Marquette and North Carolina State to fight it out for number one of the nation. The UCLA reign did not die easily. Let's watch how it happened. The long-awaited semifinal had number one ranked North Carolina State against number two ranked UCLA, the defending champs. and Tuck's struggle is tied at the half, but UCLA pulls away in the opening moments of the second half to establish an 11-point lead on a Bill Walton rebound. The Wolfpack lost a regular season contest to the Bruins by 18 points, their only setback of the year. But they won't fold this time as David Thompson steals and goes all the way. North Carolina State fights back from not one, but two separate 11-point deficits as Big Tom Burleson plays Bill Walton to a standstill at center. The halftime score was all even, and the teams are knotted up again at the end of regulation time at 65 apiece. The overtime session is tense and tight, as the teams can only produce one basket each. With the score tied at 67-67, North Carolina State has a chance to win it with just 15 seconds remaining. Mo Rivers looks for David Thompson, the man everyone expects to take the last shot. Thompson, well covered by Keith Wilkes, passes inside to Tom Burleson. Burleson maneuvers against Walton. He fakes, shoots, and it bounces off the rim. The buzzer sounds, and the game goes into double overtime. UCLA races out to a seven-point lead in the first minute and a half of the second overtime. But North Carolina State comes right back at them again, and Burleson's rebound bucket closes the gap to one. Dave Myers misses a critical one-and-one one for the Bruins. Thompson goes sky-high for the rebound, and the Wolfpack goes hunting for victory. 
North Carolina State moves the ball patiently, and this time you can be sure David Thompson will take the big shot. Again, Keith Wilkes has the defensive assignment. Thompson starts his dribble. He drives to his left. Goes up with a jump shot and banks it in. State takes the lead for good with one minute to go and moves into the finals with an incredible double overtime win over UCLA, 80 to 77. The second ranked team gone. North Carolina State must face number three, the Warriors of Marquette. Little Monty Towers, long distance bombing, keeps the Wolf Pack on an even keel early in the contest. Marquette hangs tough, but State turns a 28 27 deficit into a 17 point lead with a devastating 22 4 burst. David Thompson handles the rebounding and scoring chores along with Tom Burleson to break it open. Daniels jump shot and a dipsy doodle drive by Marcus Washington helps Marquette cut the margin to 10 but coach Norm Sloan orders his team into a ball control offense to slow the tempo down. Mo Rivers hits a short jumper and the Wolfpack lead is back up to 13. Marquette still won't quit. Maury Ellis passes to Maurice Lucas and Lucas scores. Rivers gets it back, arching his shot high over the leap of Lucas, and North Carolina State's lead is 13 again. The Warriors keep hustling through the final minute of action, but they can't make up ground on the pack. North Carolina State, referred to as one of the great college teams on record by coach Norm Sloan, takes the NCAA championship by defeating number two UCLA and number three Marquette in successive games. The final score is North Carolina State 76, Marquette 64, and there's no doubt about it. North Carolina State is number one. We proudly present the 43rd annual Converse All-America basketball team. Working in alphabetical order, we begin with Marvin Barnes of Providence College, the second draft pick in the NBA, following only Bill Walton this year. Barnes turned down pro office a year ago after his junior season. At six foot nine, he was an overpowering rebounder and scorer for the Friars. Barnes will probably be able to make the transition to the pro ranks at center, but if his lack of super height is a problem, he could still make it at a forward slot. Another number 24, Tom Burleson, does have super height at seven foot four. One of the most improved college players over the past year, he won the MVP trophy in the Atlantic Coast Conference Tournament that carried North Carolina State into the NCAA championships. Burleson scored over 2,000 points in his college career and was the leading rebounder in the NCAA Classic. Big Tom was the first round draft pick of another rather impressive center, Bill Russell of the Seattle Supersonics. Big man at six foot nine, Len Elmore broke all existing rebound records at Maryland. His scoring, rebounding, and shot blocking make him a natural for the Converse All-America squad. Len's off-the-court work with ghetto youngsters in New York and Maryland make him an All-America selection in more ways than one. Bob Jones of North Carolina is 6'9 and can do it all. Shooting, rebounding, passing, and defense are all integral parts of Bob Jones' game. An excellent student as well, Bob majored in psychology. In spite of a heavy scholastic schedule, Bob Jones was first team all ACC and a first round draft pick of the Houston Rockets. Millen of Maryland is yet another Atlantic Coast Conference star on the Converse All-America team. At 6 foot 11, Tom holds the Maryland scoring record with 1,807 points in three varsity seasons. One of the top student athletes in the country, Tom is Maryland's first Rhodes Scholar, a pre-med major, and graduated just two-tenths of a point shy of a straight-A average.
Cappy Russell of the University of Michigan is a versatile performer. At 6'8", Cappy played every possible position for the Wolverines. He captured the Big Ten's MVP award and was named the outstanding player at the NCAA Mideast Regionals. A junior, Russell applied for a hardship status and was the number one pick of the Cleveland Cavaliers. John Shoemate of Notre Dame recovered from a near-fatal illness in his sophomore year to ring up over 1,300 points in two seasons for the Irish. A rugged rebounder at 6'9", Shoemate is also some kind of shooter with a sensational 62.7 field goal percentage. David Thompson of North Carolina State was selected as the most valuable player on the NCAA tournament. A junior, Thompson turned down all pro offers to finish his college education. At six foot four, David's leaping ability is hard to believe. In three Wolfpack seasons, he has 682 rebounds and over 2,000 points. The fantastic talents of this young man make him an odds-on favorite to rejoin the Converse All-America team next year for the third straight time. Bill Walton of UCLA was named the Player of the Year for the third consecutive season. In 1973, Walton received the Sullivan Award as the top amateur athlete in the United States, only the second basketball player ever to be so honored. The UCLA team leader specialized in dominating the opposition at both ends of the court. He ran up more than 2,000 career points, almost 1,700 rebounds, and blocked shots almost at will. The first player selected in the NBA college draft was, of course, Bill Walton. And he's already signed a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract to play professional basketball for the Portland Trailblazers. Rounding out our 1974 Converse All-America team is Walton's UCLA teammate, Keith Wilkes. Known for his smooth as silk style of play, Wilkes was the number two scorer on the Bruins' powerful Walton gang. The finals of the American Basketball Association playoffs pit the East Division champion New York Nets against the best in the West, the Utah Storms. The rapidly maturing Nets are on a playoff hot streak that eliminated Virginia in five games and rolled through the Kentucky Colonels in four straight. The youngest team in pro basketball refuses to be bothered by playoff pressure. 1974's league MVP is Julius Irving. Dr. J's magical moves performed major surgery on the opposition all year long. And the playoffs are serving as yet another personal showcase for basketball's most exciting superstar. The good doctor poured in 47 points as the Nets won the series opener against Utah, then tailed off with a mere 32 in the second game romp. Brian Taylor was the third game hero in Utah with a three-point bomb that sent the contest into overtime. Larry Keenan took over from there, and the Nets are now just one victory away from the ABA crown. The Stars have been severely handicapped. Zelmo Beatty missed the first two games and stepped out of a sick bed onto the court with a gallant 22-point effort that almost turned the tide in game three. Beatty and his Utah teammates realize that four in a row over the Nets is a near impossible order. But Big Z comes on strong, and the Stars take command in the final quarter of game four. Of course, no game is over when Dr. J is on the court, and Julius keeps the Nets close. Irving finally misses. Or does he? When you're hot, you're hot. But Utah's Jimmy Jones is the key man in game four as the Stars break New York's spell with a 97-89 victory. Coach Joe Mullaney hopes his team can win one on the road as the series comes east. New York's rookie coach Kevin Logrie wishes it would all end with game five. The Nets own a slim three-point lead when the fourth quarter begins as John Williamson shoots, misses, and Dr. J soars up to tap it in. Billy Pauls works against Zelmo Beatty in the pivot. Pauls puts the ball on the floor, hooks right, and banks it in. A pretty shot. Rick Mount passes out to Gerald Govan. The defensive-minded big man is on target with one of his infrequent shots. But Dr. J retaliates immediately with a long jump before the Nets. New York continues to look for Irving, but Willie Wise anticipates the pass and makes the steal. Wise drives the length of the floor for two Utah points. 
Bill Falls, Larry Keenan, and John Williamson helped the Nets pull away in the last five minutes. MVP Irving adds the finishing touches, and the New York Nets have their first American Basketball Association championship all wrapped up. The New York Nets beat the Utah Stars 111 to 100 to take the series four games to one, and the Nassau Coliseum fans count down the final seconds before mobbing their heroes on the court. The finals of the National Basketball Association playoffs match the teams with the two best regular season records. The Boston Celtics romped through the East with 56 wins, 26 losses, while the Milwaukee Bucks wiped out the West with 59 up, 23 down. Led by league MVP Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Bucks reached the final round with ease as they eliminated the Los Angeles Lakers and the Chicago Bulls in just nine games, even though Oscar Robinson had to carry a big load in the backcourt with Lucius Allen's sideline. With veteran John Havlicek paving the road, the Boston Celtics fought past the Buffalo Braves in six games and then eliminated the defending world champion New York Knicks in five. Fiery Dave Cowens owned the backboards and scored almost at will against New York, but he'll require extra help against Abdul-Jabbar in the finals. The swarming defensive tactics of the Celtics puts pressure on the undermanned Milwaukee backcourt. It also forces Abdul-Jabbar to look for the open man on the offensive end, but only after making the Bucks struggle to get across half-court. The Celtics employ an unrelenting 48-minute full-court press. The fearless and tireless Boston defense is the major story throughout this incredibly physical seven-game series. Hustle and desire may sound trite to others, but to the Celtics, it's the only way to play. With John Havlicek carrying the scoring load and Dave Cowens and Paul Silas neutralizing Abdul-Jabbar in the rebounding department, the Boston Celtics return to the glory days with their first NBA championship since the Bill Russell era ended in 1969. Strangely, in a series that went down to a seventh game finale, the one contest that will be best remembered was game six in the Boston Garden as the Milwaukee Bucks battled to stay alive with the Celtics leading three games to two. Milwaukee coach Larry Costello pleads for defense as the Celtics go to Dave Cowens in the closing seconds of a tie game. Cowens shot a short, and now the Bucks have a last second chance to win it. Boston's tough defense forces John McLaughlin to shoot from the corner. It's no good, and the game goes into overtime. In the overtime, Oscar Robertson maneuvers for position. The big old fakes and shoots. And Milwaukee takes the lead. The Bucks have a chance to win it. But Curtis Perry's pass to Bob Dandridge bounces loose. And here comes John Havlicek with Boston down by two. Havlicek shoots and misses. Gets his own rebound and scores to tie it up. There are only three seconds left. And the Bucks can't get a shot off as Jojo White glues himself to Robertson. The score is 90-90 with overtime number two coming up. The Celtics go to Havlicek. En route to a game high of 36, John comes through again with a three-point play. The Bucks want it back, so they call on Kareem for his trusty skyhook. Who else but Havlicek answers Abdul-Jabbar by banking one in off the glass? Coach Tom Hankson helps his Celtics get back on defense where the Bucks look for Kareem but have to settle for Mickey Davis in an effort to beat the 24-second clock. Davis gets the shot over Silas. It's good! The Celtics rely on Havlicek once more. Abdul-Jabbar comes over to help out. Havlicek hits it anyway. Boston 101, Milwaukee 100 with seven seconds left in the second overtime. Abdul-Jabbar looks for an open man inside and finds no one. He drives, hooks it up from 15 feet out. It's good! The Bucks lead 102-101 and there's just three seconds remaining on the clock.
Paul Westfall back to Jojo White for a 30-footer. It's short, and the Bucks win it in double overtime. The Celtics go on to take the series four games to three, but there's no doubt that game six will be remembered as one of the most exciting NBA playoff games in history.